Rambo, as a series of four films, has changed a great deal over time, and I'm not just talking about the latest instalment, which was made a full 20 years after the previous. Rambo First Blood is a vastly different film to Rambo 2 and 3, and of course the fourth instalment, slightly confusingly just called Rambo. Now I'm just going to be concentrating on the films, although Rambo appears in many other mediums. Cartoons, video games, I imagine a, a few variations of Halloween costumes. I guess it's a pretty easy Halloween costume, you just take your top off. Unless you spend the previous year getting ripped. Anyway, despite mainly concentrating on the films, we need to first look at the book, just called First Blood. David Morrell started First Blood in 1968, which is the year the Tet Offensive happened. So I guess you could say he was pretty on it. Rambo is hitchhiking into a town. The cops don't want him there because they think he's a drifter, so they try to push him out. He keeps coming back, so they arrest him and try to cut his hair, because I guess they've got nothing better to do. All of that happens in the movie. Now this is where the spoilers start. The first main difference is when Rambo escapes the police station in the book, he kills a cop. In the film, he doesn't kill anyone. In the book, he goes on to become a fugitive, and he's hunted down by the police, the National Guard, and eventually the Special Forces. In the film, we meet Colonel Troutman, who's sympathetic to Rambo, and the nearest thing he has to a friend. We'll talk about him more in detail when we get to the film itself. In the book, Troutman is a critical part of the hunt, and he's the one who eventually kills Rambo. That's right, in the book, Rambo is killed, as too is the sheriff who's hunting him down, Sheriff Teasel, who in the film is played by Brian Dennehy. The film creates a very sympathetic Rambo. The book is much more multi-layered. We still sympathise with Rambo, but also, he's a maniac. In 1972, Morel sold the rights to First Blood to Columbia Pictures, who then sold them to Warner Brothers. After 18 screenplays, it seemed that the project was forever going to languish in development hell. Now, while it was not getting made, so many people were attached or softly attached to various characters. For Rambo, Clint Eastwood, Robert De Niro, Steve McQueen, even John Travolta. With Cinema Group financing and Filmways distributing, there was a serious effort to get Rambo made at the end of the 70s, with John Frankenheimer directing. But then Filmways was bought by Orion, who put the project on the back burner. But then two distribution and investment wonderkins, Andrew G. Vayner and Mario Cassar, acquired the rights. Their company, Carol Co., was looking for a big commercial success, and with a return of $125 million on a $15 million budget, Rambo First Blood catapulted them into the big leagues. After Rambo, they went on to produce Terminator 2 and Total Recall. The good one, I mean. And then, later on, they went bankrupt. Anyway, this video isn't about that. With Caraco behind it, Rambo First Blood finally got made. With Sylvester Stallone, who had worked with Carol Coe in the 1981 film Escape from Victory, Rambo is about a Vietnam vet who comes to a backwater town and ends up being hunted down in the woods, eventually counter-attacking the town like a one-man army and facing off with the town sheriff before being talked down by his old unit colonel. And that's the critical difference between the film and the book. In the film, Rambo lives, as does the sheriff. In fact, that difference alone was enough to make Kirk Douglas, who was originally cast as Trapman, walk off the production, only one day into shooting. Later on, an ending where Rambo takes his own life was filmed, although it's not the same as the events in the book. Replacing Douglas was Richard Krenner, who does a great job in bringing a slight oddness to Colonel Troutman. After Rambo escapes from a police station and defeats his police pursuers single-handedly, Troutman appears out of nowhere and says stuff like, I didn't come here to rescue Rambo from you. I came here to rescue you from him. It's never clear if he's just there as an observer, and he seems to enjoy the fact that someone he made... God didn't make Rambo. I made him. ...is still an effective combatant. Somewhere in Troutman, in this film, there's a real malevolence. He's pragmatic. He's funny. He's there to help, but he doesn't seem to really care. And this is what's so unique about Rambo. He's not a typical action movie hero, at least not yet. Even if at the end he's walking around with an M60. He arrives in town looking for a friend who's just died of cancer. Cancer? Brought it back from there. All that orange stuff that spread it around. He has flashbacks of being tortured by the NBA. 
He doesn't kick ass. He systematically deconstructs it. He isn't a swashbuckling hero. He isn't dashing. He doesn't have whopping one-liners. He's an extremely damaged individual who, unfortunately for the police, has had living off the land and close quarter combat drilled into him. To me, this film is strongly anti-war. Not anti-war in necessarily an of-the-day political way. If anything, it has a dig at people who disrespect veterans. But anti-war in the way that it portrays war as being very not glorious. It really portrays war as being particularly traumatic. You've got a special unit who are all dead except for Rambo. One of them died from Agent Orange, apparently, which means he died at the hands of his own government. Rambo is a war hero who's treated like shit. He says hippies called him a baby killer, and the police don't exactly respect him either. He doesn't look like he'll have a chance at leading a normal life anytime soon. He's messed up. And there's this. In town, you're the law. I hear it's me. Don't push it. Don't push it, I'll give you a war you won't believe. Let it go. Yeah, it's a threat. But what is going on in his head? It's like a window into a nightmare. It's like Roy Batty in Blade Runner saying, I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. <laughs> Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. Okay, it's tonally different, but they both give us a glimpse into something terrible. Stallone himself did about seven revisions of the script. He must have seen the anti-war connotations of the story. This isn't Rambo firing rockets from a helicopter. This is post-traumatic Rambo being hunted down by people who are meant to be on his side and hunting them back and sparing their lives because he lives by a code and maybe because he's seen enough killing. As I said, he very deliberately never kills anyone and this is very different to the sequel. James Cameron wrote the first draft of the first sequel and reportedly Rambo was intended to have a partner and reportedly the producers wanted John Travolta. But Stallone said no. First Blood Part 2 starts off solemn enough, with Trapman visiting Rambo at a prison labour camp and offering him a deal. So anyway, Rambo's given the task of taking recon photos of American servicemen still being held by the Vietnamese. And he and Trapman look at each other like they both know that photography is the only thing that Rambo is really bad at. Rambo has to cut away his equipment, then he lands in Vietnam, meets up with Agent Ko, and rescues a POW. This is around the time the killing starts. Rambo killed zero people in First Blood. He just threw a stone at a helicopter and someone accidentally fell out of it. That was the only death. In First Blood 2, Rambo kills 74 people. I kind of think it's worth noting that at the beginning of the film, Rambo's credentials are listed. He has 59 confirmed kills. So in First Blood 2, which takes place over two days, Rambo kills more people than the number of confirmed kills he got during the entire Vietnam War. And boy is it spectacular. <laughs> this time the bad guy is Murdoch, a US spook who betrays Rambo and Troutman. He never wanted Rambo to come back with pictures of POWs. Instead, they want confirmation there are none, so things don't get all heated up again. Again, as in the first film, authority is the enemy. As in the first film, the troops are betrayed. There's a scene where Troutman comes to pick up Rambo, but the mission is aborted. Now if this isn't a metaphor, I don't know what is. And then Trapman says this. Don't ever cut me with you and your scum. It was a lie, wasn't it? Just like the whole damn war, it was a lie. We're then introduced to Colonel Podovsky, played by Steve Burkoff, who is our second antagonist. He tortures Rambo and says they, and by they I mean those pesky Russians, intercepted the transmissions from the rescue helicopter and he explains to Rambo that Murdoch sold him out, which is when Rambo, under duress, says this. Murdoch. I'm coming to get you. 
So then Ko gets killed and Rambo goes on a bit of a blood bender. A favourite for me is this. Or what about this one? Oh hey, is that a... Is that a helicopter? So Rambo defeats Padovsky, rescues the POWs and returns to base where he threatens Murdoch and shoots all of his computers. If you go into First Blood 2 having loved the first film and expecting more of the same, you're only going to be disappointed. Tonally, they're completely different. The second film makes no effort to be anywhere near as thoughtful. It's focused on action, and the nuanced adversary created by Brian Dennehy in First Blood is nowhere near matched by the caricature-like antagonists of First Blood 2. But if you don't go into it with those expectations, you might come out thinking that it's an enjoyable, albeit silly, action film. To be honest, it's so on the verge of having its tongue in its cheek so often, I kind of wish they'd done what Terminator 2 Judgment Day had done and have a bit more fun with it. On the BBC's Graham Norton show, Sylvester Stallone said that First Blood 2 was his least favourite of the Rambo series. He said it was like a cartoon. And you can certainly level that against it. When I first decided to look through the Rambo series, and before I actually watched it again, I thought that I would end up saying that the first film is anti-war and the second one is either pro-war or, or glamorises it. But I don't think that. I don't think Rambo 2 actually has much to do with war. I mean, is Commando glamorising war? I think the audience always knew this wasn't intended to be seen as combat realism. It's more on the line of action fantasy. There's kind of a lot of political statements in there. Rambo shoots the computers and threatens Murdoch. It's certainly anti-establishment. But then Rambo says this. I want what they want. And every other guy who came over here has spilt his guts and gave everything he had once for our country to love us as much as we love it. Now, I don't think the difference between Rambo 1 and Rambo 2 is anti-war and pro-war. I think the critical difference is the first film is about a veteran who's really fucked up. He's got massive PTSD, he freaks out, and on some level, he thinks he's back in Nam. First Blood 2 seemingly dispenses with the idea that Rambo has mental problems, and in fairness, he may have worked them out. But regardless, it focuses much more on disrespect to veterans than on them needing social or mental care, or on the effects of war on their psychology. Rambo, a veteran used and abused and kicked to the curb, has to go into Vietnam to rescue some POWs, who Murdoch, representing a real politicking government, would rather just disappeared. It's not so much anti-war anymore as anti-establishment. Rambo's been betrayed, sure, but he loves his country, because this film seems to make a caveat to the message of the first, that Rambo was betrayed not by his country, but by the government, the bureaucrats, the man. It's an important distinction, because I think you could probably accuse First Blood of being quite subversive. Imagine in the modern day, a veteran of special forces operations in Afghanistan comes home, he tries to hitchhike across America to meet other veterans, he's kicked out of a small town by a police force in a very heavy-handed way. Then he goes absolutely nuts, still wearing his desert boots and goggles. First Blood 2 negates that, necessarily perhaps to be the blockbuster it became by saying, America is great, it was the politicians that let us down. That's the way I see it, at least. I can see why you might argue that it is pro-war, but I don't think it's grounded in reality enough for that. Rambo 3 starts with Troutman and embassy suit Robert Griggs looking for Rambo with Sylvester Stallone's spotlight picture. They find him fighting for cash, and there's an intense moment where Rambo looks like he's going to kill the other guy. He's still got that killer instinct, but he's not a slave to it. Anyway, Troutman and Griggs try to convince Rambo to do a bit of dirty work for the US in Afghanistan, fighting the Russian invasion. Rambo declines, and the next thing we know, Troutman, embedded with local fighters, is captured by those again pesky Russians. Mark de Jong, playing Russian Colonel Zayson, is the baddie. After all, in the end, what everyone really wants is peace. 
Before the violence starts proper, Rambo plays a game with the Mujahideen, which I suspect is a very deliberate effort to make the Mujahideen relatable to an American audience. They love sports, they're just like us. Rambo 3 is a lot thicker in its delivery of its politics, towing the line of the then US foreign policy. If you'd studied your history, you'd know that these people have never given up to anyone. They'd rather die than be slaves to an invading army. You can't defeat a people like that. We tried. We already had our Vietnam. Now you're gonna have yours. Then those bloody Russians attack an Afghan compound and, well, this film couldn't be more direct in its beliefs. And the women are raped and killed. Last year in the valley of Legman, the next valley, 6,000 Afghans were killed. Pregnant women were cut with bayonets and their babies thrown into the fires. This is done so they will not have to fight the next generation of Afghans. Yet nobody sees anything or reads anything in the papers. After initial failure, Rambo frees Troutman, and there's a battle in a cave which ends with this memorable moment. He was going to die by falling, then he broke his neck, then he exploded. No wonder this was considered the most violent film ever made, at the time, by quite a few critics. Although, they must have meant the most violent mainstream film ever made, because, I mean, there's still Cannibal Holocaust. So who does Rambo face off against at the end? Well, the entire Russian army. I mean, obviously not really, but a lot of Russians. It kind of looks like Rambo and Troutman are going to die rather than be captured. But no. The Mujahideen comes to the rescue, and Rambo takes control of a Russian tank, kills Zaysen, and the film ends with a dedication to the gallant people of Afghanistan, although it was originally a dedication to the brave Mujahideen fighters. So this film, the most expensive made at the time, clearly has a lot staked in its anti-Soviet invasion of Afghanistan message. This, I feel, was a bit of opportunism in regards to the political situation. When filming began, there was very much a focus in the US of getting Russia out of Afghanistan. But Rambo 3 came out on the 25th of May, 1988, 10 days after the Russians announced they were going to leave Afghanistan. Because of that, Rambo 3 lost a lot of its intended impact. The tone of Rambo 3 is very similar to that of Rambo 2. They really are very similar movies. However, the commentary of mistreatment of veterans that's present in Rambo 2 is entirely absent in Rambo 3. It still exists ever so slightly in a few remarks about denying responsibility, but you could easily miss those. Rambo doesn't get done over. He doesn't get betrayed. Whilst I don't think this is a pro-war film again, it's not an anti-war film either. It's certainly not subversive. Other than it being released slightly too late and therefore being probably harder on the Russians than the US government was at the time, with the Russians withdrawing and with Glasnost and Perestroika happening. One thing I think worth mentioning is that the director, Peter MacDonald, said that he wanted to use Rambo 3 to try and make Rambo more vulnerable and funny. There are a few funny moments, and I guess you can kind of see what might have been, but I guess the majority of the self-knowing nods that may have made Rambo 3 more like Terminator 2 ended up on the cutting room floor. What does this one? It's a blue light. What does it do? It turns blue. I see. So Rambo 3 made 189 million dollars, three times its budget. But I guess those around it felt that enough was enough. I guess the 80s were different to the current age in that franchises weren't necessarily done to death. I think now those results would have seen Rambo 4 being made in the early 90s and probably a Rambo 5 as well. Well, as well as Carol Coe going broke, in the mid-90s, Stallone said he didn't want to do any more action films. Miramax still acquired the rights in 1997 and sold them to New Films and Millennium Films, and they're the ones that made the fourth instalment, Rambo. Now, obviously, 20 years on, this film is going to be different. It starts with a montage of news clips about Burma, where the action here is set, and the film looks totally different to the previous in the series. The beginning of the film is instantly more distressing than any moment of the others. Hello, 
suddenly the violence isn't cartoony over the top fun. Okay, so maybe prisoners of war being tortured and Afghan civilians being strafed by helicopters isn't fun either, but it isn't as heavy as this. The story is quite familiar. Rambo is badgered into taking some missionaries into Burma, but then things go bad and he has to rescue them. This time, he's charged with just ferrying a team of dickhead mercenaries to do the work, but he can't stop himself from joining in. The rest of the film is essentially Rambo and the Mercs rescuing the missionaries. It's entirely humorless, often upsetting, and very bloody. Whilst it doesn't have the distressing resonance of something like Come and See, it's still very, very graphic. The spectacle is different in this film. Films 2 and 3 were all about explosions and shooting down Russian helicopters. And those things are here. But the emphasis has shifted from pyrotechnics to disembowelment and people turning into red paste. Stallone, who directed Rambo 4 and wrote it with Art Monterostelli, called the Burmese military junta Satan's Disciples. He wanted to make this film an attack on those people and show the world how things were going down in Burma. Now maybe you could argue that this is Stallone making a film that has a genuine message, making a film that is trying to direct attention to a humanitarian crisis. Maybe you could argue it's quite cynical. The violence and the content are there to grab people's attention, to get people talking about how bloody the new Rambo film is and get them into the cinema. Maybe you could argue it's both. Stallone was in his early 60s when he made Rambo in 2008, and it feels a lot more jaded. The tone is pessimistic. It's nowhere near as swashbuckling as Rambo 2 and 3. I don't think it has the depth of First Blood, and it certainly focuses its attentions externally rather than internally. Very little is added to Rambo's character, and the film isn't about him, as First Blood was, but rather what he does. Still, this film is the sequel most like the first. It rounds off the series, although a sequel was intended, but it's now been cancelled. For me, First Blood will always be the best. For all the blood and guts in Rambo 2008, that violence doesn't come anywhere near just the threat of violence in First Blood. I think the real horror in any of the films is the horror that Rambo has experienced previous to the events of First Blood, and that's precisely because that horror is unseen. It's only suggested. It's a war you won't believe. What do you think about the Rambo series? Do you have a favourite? Do you have a least favourite? Thank you, as ever, for joining me. Please make sure to subscribe, and I'll see you next time.